Hello, and welcome to our second cardiology trial rewind video. This video is going to focus on the randomized aldactone evaluation trial, or RAILS or RALS. My name is Kristen Watson. I'm an associate professor at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy and a member of the Atrium Cardiology Collaborative. Before we delve into the study, I just want to first talk about what the standard of care of practice of patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or systolic function was at that time. Standard of care included the use of an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor and then a loop diuretic to control symptoms in patients. The use of digoxin could also be considered in this group of patients. As you can note, standard of care at this time did not include beta blocker therapy. Those trials start to come out around the time of the publication of this study. So the purpose of this study was to determine if spironolactone and aldosterone antagonists would significantly reduce the risk of all-cause death in those with severe systolic heart failure who were receiving standard of therapy, so an ACE inhibitor and a loop diuretic. And the study was designed because preliminary data show that there may be a role for aldosterone antagonist therapy in this population, and it was also noted that the renin-angiotensin system was activated in this patient group. So let's talk about who was enrolled in this study. Patients were included if they had more severe symptoms, so New York Heart Association class 3 to class 4 symptoms, and they had to carry the heart failure diagnosis for at least six weeks. Patients, if tolerated, needed to be receiving ACE inhibitor therapy, and all patients needed to be receiving loop diuretic therapy. Patients were also had to have a left ventricular ejection fraction of less than or equal to 35%. Notable exclusion criteria included the use of potassium sparing diuretic because knowing that the addition of an aldosterone antagonist to an ACE inhibitor could increase the risk of hyperkalemia, as well as those with elevated serum creatinine greater than 2.5, again knowing this population would have that increased risk of hyperkalemia with the addition of therapy, those with an elevated baseline serum potassium and hepatic failure. Other notable exclusion, other notable exclusion criteria included operable valvular heart disease, unstable angina, active cancer, or life-threatening disease. Those who were enrolled in the study were randomized to receive either 25 milligrams of spironolactone or placebo once daily. The use of supplemental potassium was discouraged unless the potassium was less than 3.5. And I think this is a very important thing for us to remember when using spironolactone or even a plerinone in patients with heart failure is that we really want to avoid potassium supplementation unless clinically indicated. There was close monitoring of serum creatinine and potassium throughout the study. At eight weeks, if patients had progression of heart failure without having evidence of hyperkalemia, the dose of the medication could be increased to spironolactone 50 milligrams. When the dose was increased, to if a group of patients had the dose of the study medication increase up to 50 milligrams, there was more frequent monitoring of serum creatinine and potassium. As discussed previously, the primary outcome of this study was all-cause death. This trial was stopped early due to the benefit of spironolactone on this outcome being higher than anticipated. Patients were followed for a mean of 24 months. The majority of patients, about 70%, were had New York Heart Association class three symptoms at baseline. 94% of patients were receiving an ACE inhibitor and all patients were receiving a loop diuretic. Again, recalling that standard of care during this time was much different. Only about 10% of patients enrolled in the study received beta blocker therapy. The average age of patients was 65 years, 80%, 86% of them were white and 73% were male. As represented on this graph here on the y-axis with you see survival and then um, months on the x-axis, you can see that there was a lower rate of death in those patients who received spironolactone versus placebo. The use of spironolactone was associated with a 30% reduction in the risk of all-cause death. And you can see this benefit was seen relatively early on during the course of therapy. There was also a 30% 30 redu re reduction in the risk of hospitalization 
and a significant improvement in New York Heart Association among those patients who receive spironolactone versus placebo. The mean dose of spironolactone used by study participants was 26 milligrams. So let's look at safety. While we know that spironolactone we see here is associated with a significant reduction in outcomes, we do need to pair that with safety because we do know that the addition of an aldosterone antagonist may increase that risk of hyperkalemia. Again, recalling that monitoring was pretty close for serum creatinine and potassium throughout the study period. Serious hyperkalemia, as defined as a potassium of six or more, was no different between the two groups. There were statistically significant differences in the raisin serum creatinine and serum potassium in the spironolactone group, but these were not of clinical significance. The difference that you can see in the risk of side effects is gynecomastia, so breast tenderness or swelling in men, was 9% in the spironolactone group and 1% in the placebo group. And that the discontinuation rate due to gynecomastia was higher, again, in the patients who received spironolactone. So I think it's always important for us to remember when we're encountering our patients who receive spironolactone um, is to ask about that side effect because it's not something patients are going to want to readily disclose. I will tell you that the majority of times that I will determine that a patient has gynecomastia is laying my stethoscope on their chest and getting a little recoil from them because of the tenderness. So based on these overwhelming results, the use of spironolactone really took off in practice very quickly, which was great. There, we're going to just briefly talk about a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2004 to talk about the real-world data and safety of spironolactone post rals So looking at a, a registry, the, looking at the prescription rate of those with heart failure on ACE inhibitor, in 1994, 34 per 1,000 patients were receiving aldosterone antagonist therapy. Remember the results of this trial were published in New England in 1999. By early 2001, 149 per 1,000 patients with heart failure on ACE inhibitor were receiving aldosterone antagonism therapy. Looking a little bit further, looking at the table here, so the risk of hospital admission associated with hyperkalemia went from four out of 1,000 patients in early 1999, when the trial was, right before the trial was published, to 11 per 1,000 patients in late 2001, seeing a significant increase in that rate of events. In hospital, death from hyperkalemia also significantly increased over that time period. I think what the impo my important takeaway from this study is that we know that the benefit of spironolactone exists, but to be prudent in prescribing or recommending this therapy. We need to ensure that our patients will be reliable and follow up and that we set up a monitoring plan for our patients and kind of have a routine thing that we use in our practice for ensuring follow up from transitioning to the, if it started in the inpatient setting, when they're gonna have that follow up blood work in the outpatient setting. And then for those of us like myself who practice in the ambulatory care setting, kind of ha having a process in place for once aldosterone antagonism therapy is started, when those lab values are going to be collected. The American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association outlines nice recommendations for this monitoring in their guidelines. So that wraps up our cardiology trial rewind on the RAILS trial. Stay tuned for future videos on the Ephesus and Emphasis HS trials, which explore the use of aldosterone antagonists in different groups of patients with heart failure. Just a hint, those two studies, Ephesus, which include patients with LV dysfunction and post-myocardial infarction, and Emphasis HS, which looked at patients with mild heart failure, the use of aldosterone and antagonist therapy also reduced the risk of death in other outcomes. One question that lingered after the results of the RALS trial was, well, what would happen in patients when beta blocker therapy was on board? Would, the, you, would that benefit still stay? And when you look at these, these future studies, Ephesus and Emphasis HF, those patients were, real, the majority of patients were receiving beta blocker, and you still saw that pronounced effect. Thanks for joining.